bless the Lord. I want to welcome you all this morning into the house of God. We're going to give God some praise. I want you to put your hands together, lift your voice. Let's love on Jesus. Come on, church. Hey! Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior.
God today. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, we came here to worship God. I want you to take your mind off everything else. Put your mind on the risen King, the soon coming King, the one who's resurrected from the dead. Death cannot hold him. Let him have his way in your heart today. Surrender to him. Come on, say, yeah. I feel a breakthrough coming. Come on. Christ is mine. If you believe it today, Lord of mine. Turning back, oh, 
Jesus. There is none like you. You are wonderful and lovely. Hey, you give us beauty for ashes, and we rejoice in you. Give him praise, oh ye saints of God today. Lift your voice and surrender. There is none like you. We look to no other. You are all we need. We worship you, Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord God. You are wonderful. Amen. What a wonderful presence of God in this place. A real spirit of victory as God is bringing breakthrough in many, many lives across our city and in this congregation. We want to take this time as we go before the Lord in prayer. We want to pray for a number of needs. We want to pray for Brother Alan Hageman. Uh, needs a miracle touch from God in his body. We want to pray for Charlie Fierro as well. Uh, we want to pray for and continue to pray for Ernie Ruby had a, a good surgery and is now on the other side recovering, and so we thank God for that, but let's pray for his recovery. Uh, let's continue to pray for uh, Brody Reblin as well, God's hand upon uh, this young child. We want to pray as well this week. This is the start of our Prescott Conference, the conference uh, of our mother church up in Prescott, Arizona, and uh, many, many people from this congregation are going up. I think we're sending up some 18 delegate couples and uh, people, and so uh, we're going to flood Prescott with, uh, with our people, and we want to pray that God would just touch every person going up there, that our hearts would be stirred. We want to pray for all the pastors, preachers, uh, uh, all the pastors coming from around the world. Uh, I was talking to Pastor Greg, and he said there's some 115 international workers coming in this year for this conference in particular. And so it's going to be a, a very powerful time of God moving upon uh, our churches around the world and our church in particular. So let's pray for that, that God would have his way traveling grace and mercy upon everybody who is uh, traveling to that as well. Let's lift up this morning service in prayer uh, and this evening service, just this day that we're dedicating to the Lord and saying, God, this day belongs to you. We're setting it apart to worship you. We want to hear from you. Our hearts are open to you. Let's lift up our voices before the Lord uh, and our own needs before the Lord. Brother Jacob Pinedo is going to come and open our service in prayer this morning. Father, we're so grateful uh, for your presence in this place. We thank you for the work of salvation salvation and redemption that you have done in our hearts uh, God and in our lives we come before you this morning a desperate and a needy people God we're asking you uh, as we lift up these needs before you Lord that you would uh, have your way Lord you would minister God we ask you'd set the tone for this year my God God that you'd have your way amongst our hearts God this week here in Prescott God God you would mend each and every one of us God to do the will of your glory, God. We ask, God, you lift up the needs of the people, God, here in this place, in your congregation, God. We ask that you meet the needs, God, healing, physical, spiritual, mental health, my God. We ask that you have your way in this place this morning, my God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord bless you. Why don't you greet somebody around you before you're seated this morning? Praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to be in the house of God. Hallelujah. Even Sundays after the Wildcats lose. How many know Jesus is good all the time? <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, it's the first game. The last Wildcat game I went to, uh, Pastor Warner gave me tickets. It was number one Arizona against number two Stanford. Can you believe that? Uh, hallelujah. Uh, this one wasn't quite as good, but... Uh, Amen. We had a good fellowship as we were celebrating Paula Valley's 60th birthday. Amen. He's climbed over the hill with me. Praise God. But we want to just greet everyone and welcome you to our Sunday morning service. We're glad that you could be with us. Uh, and we're going to have a great time, have a special guest speaker, Pastor Dave Suspansky. We're looking forward to that. He will be ministering in the evening service as well. And so come and pray with us an hour before. Uh, we do want to take a minute to hear a report. Uh, uh, Altered State, the music group, was able to go to Mesa and minister, and uh, so our, our brother Julio Valdez is going to come and uh, give us a report about that outreach. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it was uh, down the street from Mesa. It was actually in Chandler, so, I mean, it's all the same thing. 
but we went out there to play for Pastor Campbell, Campbell's church. Um, it was a great time. Uh, you could feel the presence of God, and um, even the door director told us afterwards, like it was just uh, the, 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 the anointing, the presence of God just filled that room. There was a ton of people, I would say at least like 80 people in that room, and um, you know, we had a chance to minister, testify, you know, just what God's been doing in our lives. And at the end of the day, uh, about four people prayed and uh, gave their life to Jesus. So praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, we would like our ushers to come forward. We want to receive an offering this morning. Um, I was talking to uh, Brother Brad Breckenridge and he made the comment to me. Isn't it interesting that God does not ask us to give 10% of our heart, of our soul, of our mind, or of our strength? When they ask Jesus, what's the most important commandment? Uh, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. He wants all that there is of us. But when it comes to tithing, he doesn't say, give me all your money. Amen. He allows us to be stewards of that. But the Bible does say, he says, the tenth is the Lord's. And, and uh, amen. I don't know about you, but uh, for me, it's a great savings to be saved and tithe. Because before I got saved, uh, all my money went into partying. And so I had all this extra money once I got saved. It was like 10%. That's like, man, I'm getting rich. Uh, um, so God is good. Amen. And uh, but the truth is, if the Lord has all our heart, soul, mind and strength, how many know he's going to have the tenth? Amen. It's not even a question. Generosity is a natural outflow of a heart that belongs to God. And uh, it's not a it's not in a tax. It's not uh, something grievous, but it's a joy. And the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. And so as we give this morning, I want to encourage you to give cheerfully and, and let's give. Let's honor the Lord with our finances. You know, uh, just all that is happening. I'll tell you, sending 18 delegate couples or 18, you know, however many that works out to Prescott, is a sizable investment for the Tucson church as well. Because I remember many years ago, Pastor Warner said, whenever we go, we send someone. We always pay our way. We always pay at least for our portion and then above beyond. He was challenging us our, as pastors to be liberal and generous. So we know that uh, this is going to be a great expense for the Prescott Church, but also for Tucson. And your giving and your liberality and generosity makes possible all that we do as a church, amen, as a fellowship. And so as our heads are bowed, our brother Israel is going to pray over the offering. My name is Michaela, and Door Church would like to welcome everyone joining us in person or online. We're so glad you can make it. As we dive into 2023, do you have any resolutions? If your goal is to strengthen your relationship with Jesus, we have a great opportunity for you. Beginning this week, join us with our weekly prayer meetings every Saturday at 10 a.m. When God's people seek Him, He always gets involved. So let's contend for new things this year. This Saturday night at 7 p.m., we'd like to welcome you out to a concert with Steve Gabriel. This is a great opportunity to bring a friend to enjoy some amazing music and hear about God's power to change lives. For more information, check out the calendar on our app or website. Attention all creatives. We need you and your unique perspectives as we plan the 2023 edition of The Bullseye. Tonight, join us at 6 p.m. in the West Classroom of the Fellowship Hall. We'll be brainstorming ideas and inspirations to bless families in our year of Jubilee. This week marks the first meeting of our ladies' Bible study about the book of Isaiah. If you haven't already, make sure to order your workbook on precept.org and join us on Thursday at 9.15 a.m. The study is open to attend online and in person, though there will be no child care available. Check out door.church news or ask Donna Shelton for more information. 
For today, those are all of the announcements. If you need more info, you can always find a full schedule and event details on our app or website at door.church slash news. We hope you have a beautiful Sunday. Hallelujah. There actually is one other announcement, a special announcement, born on Wednesday to Zach and Sarah King, Bellamy Rose King. Amen. Hallelujah. At 8.30 a.m., five pounds, 18 inches long. Amen. And uh, what's great when there's a birth, it's not only a new life, but more than just a child is being born, grandparents are being born. <laughs> and uh, uh, Pastor Garrett and Sarah King and uh, cousins are being born, uncles are being born, aunts are being born, lives are being changed and being enriched. So we're very happy for them. Amen. Uh, thank God for that. Uh, this morning, we're very blessed to have Pastor Dave Suspansky with us to minister. His wife, Benita, is here as well, and they have a special place in my heart because my daughter married their son, Steve Suspansky, and so uh, we have a relationship, and we were good friends before, and uh, since that time, uh, that relationship has been enriched. Uh, I just was privileged a couple of weeks ago on Christmas to be in the Jacksonville church, and I can tell you it's alive and thriving. Uh, Jacksonville uh, is where the largest marine base, uh, uh, Camp Lejeune, is located, and so in their church they have many marines that have come and have gotten saved and given their lives to Christ. They've been able to plant a number of churches. They host conferences, uh, and there's just a, it's it's a church on the move. It's a church alive and growing, and so uh, we're blessed to have Pastor Suspansky, who's here before the Prescott Conference, uh, and so let's welcome him as he comes to preach to us this morning. Hallelujah. It's a, it's a real blessing to be invited to preach here in Tucson for you guys. Pastor Warner invited me a few months back, and I'm, I feel it a real blessing and honor to preach here. This church has a powerful and uh, sound uh, testimony in this fellowship and for many years, and we appreciate you guys. You can open your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 12. I'm preaching a sermon. I call Forgiveness Cures, or the past is forgiven, and a uh, simple sermon, but uh, um, I, I was trying to think of something, a picture, you know, to put up on the big screen, and I, I came up with one. How many ever see those drawings of, like, in pictures and paintings of the demoniac, uh, the Gadarene? And even after they recover him, you know, all those paintings and pictures still show him a little bit off, you know. And uh, I want to tell you, God does the whole job. He doesn't leave us. Well, I take that back. We're, we're so, you know, we're still working on a lot of things, but we are forgiven. We are changed in Christ Jesus. And so I believe in our redemption through Jesus, there is absolute deliverance. And there's absolute peace of mind and peace of heart. And a few, uh, last year, and we're going to do this again in our church, a lady said she wanted to teach a class, uh, and Forgiven and Set Free, and help ladies who have uh, forgone an abortion in the past, their previous life, help them get past it. The reason she wanted to teach this is because she had been there, and for decades and decades, she carried the baggage, the wounds, the, the hurt, the confusion, difficult relations with her husband, difficult relations with her children, and even now to the grandchildren, and I just couldn't see, you know, and I, I thought to myself, well, I'm, I'm a man, I have not experienced anything like that, but uh, I thought there is a need because I began to realize she's still, she's been troubled over this and saved for 20 years, and still troubled and troubled, and so anyway, they taught the class, and I came to the end of the class, and I came that day to minister to these gals and pray for them, the handful that showed up. And lo and behold, just to make this, tighten this up a little, make it short, but here's a group of women in our church and, and some others that they reached out to who I've known a couple of these ladies for all the days of their salvation. I'm talking even decades in a couple of cases uh, of these women. And never been able to understand why. They go through some of the things they go through, but now it was becoming, coming to light. And as they concluded their, uh, their little 
ceremony that day, just had, we had prayer, we had like a memorial for those children, and these ladies made confession to God. It was, it's, it, it was very good what happened. They, they, they cleared it. They were able to face it, clear it, and I was shocked to find out not only did some of them have carried the burden of one abortion, but two or three and then the confusion with their children. And as this thing came to conclusion, these ladies were healed, were forgiven for good and set free, and they were. And how their lives have changed is mind-blowing. And uh, I thought to myself, people carry a lot of stuff in life, don't they? I, many do, men and women. They carry things, they get saved, they come to Christ, there is forgiveness, but they tend to carry things, and I know the world has... Uh, you know, coined the term PTSD for those bad moments in life so we can always reflect back and go there and say, this is why I do what I do. I want to tell you, I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to know how to live free and above my past. And there are so many things in life we can do nothing about behind us. We have to give that to God and go forward in Christ. Here in our text today is the great uh, saint of the Old Testament, David and we're going to read about an incident in his life after he has committed uh, adultery, after he has made a terrible mess of things, after he has had uh, Uriah murdered. This is bad stuff. And this is not a guy we're talking about before his initial relationship with God. This is a man that by all means knew better than to do anything that happened here. And in 2 Samuel in chapter 12, if you want to read verses 1 through 7 with me, the prophet, his pastor, Nathan, comes to him to minister to him. And the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him, and he said to them, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. He's given a little parable. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ulam, ulam which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children, and it did eat his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was unto him as a daughter. It was like a pet. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man and that was come to him. And David's anger, he's listening to this story, and what this story is, in his time, it would make perfect sense that, you know, somebody just stole, he, more powerful, bigger, better. He took the sheep from this guy, butchered it, served it to his guest, you know, wouldn't touch his own flock. David's listening to this story. This is David. He's a guilty man. He's struggling with his, what he's carrying, what has not been let go of, what has not been dealt with in his heart. And he's just listening to this story about a sheep. It's a sheep for crying out loud. I know they're important. But it's a sheep. And David gets this far in the story. He says, listen, this guy killed it. Butchered. David's anger, verse 5 said, got so hot, it was greatly kindled against that man. And he says to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, this man that has done this thing shall surely die. That's pretty intense. David's on edge. Can, can you read into that, what I'm seeing? He's, he's hot. He's upset. This has enraged him. He doesn't know the man. He doesn't know if this is a, some kind of story. He's got to learn a lesson. from. He's just hearing this like we are, you know, and the prophet comes. I'm going to tell you something. David tells him the story, and David gets up. He's incensed. Oh, this is ticking me off. This guy needs to die. And that's as far as he gets. He'll restore the lamb fourfold, he says, he that did this thing, because he had no pity. And, and Nathan turns to him in verse 7 and says, You are, David, you're the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hands of Saul. And he begins to minister to him. But I want you to focus for a minute on what is inside of David. He's carrying guilt. I mean, guilt hurts you. you gotta, you got to bring things to God in life. Uh, there's, as we read this, you know, I know there's a, I always, folks, uh, you know, go, yeah, yeah, you know, we'll see sin, uh, Christians sin all the time. No, this doesn't say people sin all the time. Matter of fact, I'm preaching a follow-up of this tonight, and we're we'll bringing some more understanding. Uh, you know, David went on to serve God all his days, but David stumbled into some stuff. 
But here he is. Here's a guilty man, and he's in trouble. And God begins to rebuke him. And the prophet says, I anointed you to over uh, uh, in, in, in this place. I gave you your master's house, verse 8 says. Your master's wives to your bosom. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if all that had been too little, I would have moreover given to you such things as these. Wherefore, if you despise this commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight, you killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, you've taken his wife to be your wife, and you've slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword uh, will never depart from your house because you've despised me and you've taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite, to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of thine own house. I'll take your wives before your eyes, give them to your neighbor, you shall lie with them, your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did this thing secretly, but I'll do this thing before all Israel. And David says to Nathan, you know what he says? He says, I have sinned. He doesn't say, you don't see the whole picture. You weren't there. You don't know what I was going. He says, me, I've done it. I sinned. He said, I take ownership. That's, that's big, folks. That's where we get set free. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put this sin away. You won't die. But there's problems. I want to minister this morning on truly being forgiven and getting past some things. You know, we need to come to grips with things in our lives. Our sin put us in a category amongst all men. We failed. That's why we came to Christ, didn't we? You know, I got saved about 45 years ago, and I thank God, I, he's so good, but I was saved, I was so saved, so filled with joy and victory and dominion, but I was only saved about three months, and I went to my pastor and I was hurting. And I, and I says, you know, I probably need to talk to you. And uh, he said, sure, you know, he's a good pastor. He said, yeah, yeah, let's talk. What are you? And I began to just tell him, I said, you know, there's things in my past. How many of you had a past? <laughs> I said, my goodness. I remember the first time I got arrested, I was all excited because they had the wrong charges. <laughs> I mean, three hours later, they kicked the door in again, had the right ones. I mean, you know, I was guilty. I remember mocking that cop, telling him, yeah, you guys think you know what you're doing, a bunch of fools, you know. No, they came back with the right charges, amen. <laughs> Guilty. We all have a past. I went to talk to my pastor. I said, you know, I started, I started to break down. He knew it was heavy and serious. And I started just to unload a few things. I know God forgave me. I, I mean, I came to him in sincerity and in repentance, but I've still got this like bruising and wounding and troublesome, you know, my thoughts and my minds and people in my past. And I think, gee. And I start to unload a few things, and all of a sudden he stops me. And he says, let that go. That's why you got saved. Give that to God. I said, man, I'm glad he didn't ask for all the details. Amen. <laughs> There's reasons, you know, I mean, we, we hit places in sin, oh my goodness. Only God can deal with. And I was feeling bad. You know, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, the, blessed are they that mourn, they'll be comforted. You know, I was being troubled over my past, but I didn't want to live in that. And I mourned, and I was troubled, and you know what? God began to touch my soul. And in many cases, we find that people can't seem to get past what they feel should have been different, what they feel should never have been done. I want to tell you, none of our sins should ever have been done. But we did them. We live in a fallen world. You can't go back. I've told people that so many times in life. You're not going to be able to go back and straighten all that out. Well, I pioneered in Southern Cal, the place I was at, just, I guess, the logistics. I don't know how many men came to me after they got saved and started to tell me things or asked me to go down to the magistrates or the police department with them, find out what's still looming over them from their past, all their guilt and sins and troubles. And you know, God had a way to deal with every one of those things. David here is a guilty man. He has messed up. But he had a hard time dealing with it. He didn't deal with it. He just let this turn into grief and condemnation. 
And you know, that stuff turns into other things, because when he's hearing this simple little story, you know, you would have probably thought, why don't you, uh, Nathan, why don't we go see this guy and demand that he gives this guy a lamb, maybe two or three. But David says, no, kill the man. He's enraged. This stuff sitting inside of him, it grows legs, it grows thoughts, it grows temperaments, it's troublesome. When I taught the class to these, or, or went to the final session of those ladies' class and just ministered on closure and freedom in Christ and redemption, you know, uh, I was, I, I went and I'd never done that before, just got that involved with trying to sort this out for ladies, you know, this issue of what they've carried, the guilt, the remorse, the pain, the, the, the memories, all, you know, and so I went and uh, to Google and looked for what do these abortion clinics offer these gals? I was amazed to find out everything I searched said this, that they all know this person's going to suffer. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, bottom line is, you know, when I read through, what are their answers? When these ladies come and knock again, say, hey, man, help me. I, you know, what they tell them is, you know, well, you got to quit hanging around with people that make you feel guilty like Christians. Uh, we don't... You know what? There's no more of an inclusive place on God's earth than his church. We open the doors, man. We even let anybody preach in our churches sometimes. I, you know, we open the doors. We, and these people say, no, you got to find out. Maybe you need to shift that blame. It wasn't your fault. They have a lot of answers, but none of them do anything. And on one side, I had searched. The final remark was, go to YouTube. Find an expert there. Yoga? Hot tea in the morning? They, they didn't have any answers. Do you know what? There are people in our Bible, and this is so wonderful when God tells this story. I'm going to preach that. He tells it all. Amen. This book is filled with people like us. Messed up people, sinners, got saved, transformed, found grace in Christ, found redemption, Old Testament and new. Paul, the great apostle, he makes no bones about it several occasions in the New Testament as he's writing these letters. And I imagine oftentimes speaking and ministering and helping people, he would make no bones about it. I was a big sinner. And I got saved. 1 Timothy 1.13, I was a blasphemer, Paul said, a persecutor, injurious. Said, I hurt folks, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly. In other words, he was able to get over that and minister to people. My wife, years ago, you know, I, I would, as I'm learning to preach and I'd minister, she'd be with me preaching somewhere, and uh, I'd use some of our, my testimony, our testimony. She'd tell me later, you don't have to tell everybody everything. They'll ask questions. <laughs> what in the world kind of person were you? A sinner? Angry sinner. That's the kind of sinner I was. Very angry. Amen. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7, and he said, when I chastised you, dealt with you, rebuked you, called you on your sin, it made you sorry. He says, you suffered some, man, you guys were hurting. That's what he says. He says, it caused you sorrow. But I don't regret it, because that sorrow was for a short time, but that sorrow led you to repentance. That's what that's there for, to get us to take ownership and say, done, God, take it from me. I want to go forward. I want to be healed. We're not meant to live in the past, folks. We're not meant to live in the, in the guilt in where we were. You know, you, you, you may suffer some remorse. You may suffer some moments like me in my earlier days just thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I probably got a list of people I need to go find in life and say, sorry about that. Didn't mean to burn your house down, you know, sorry. About that. You know, whatever, you know. But no, you know, I... God set me free.
It's good to know how to give that. Re, you know, Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those that rejoice. Weep with those that weep. You know, understand there is times of, you know, weeping it out, and then, and then rejoicing in salvation. And, uh, you know, I see people at an altar now and then in our church, you know, someone will come up bawling their eyes out, answer an altar call, getting saved, and someone will come up and dry those tears. Let me give you a, get away from them. Let them cry it out. Let them turn, let them feel it right now. There's time to rejoice. There's time to be happy. But right now, let them get past it. Let them give it up. One of these dear women in my church, I, I knew she had uh, suffered through this in her past because she would testify. She's a bold, wonderful gal. She would preach with us on outreach and stuff. And I heard her numerous times when she had the mic. She would use the term, you know, I, 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 God is so good. This and I, I murdered my baby, but I'd see her, mm, my own baby, but God help me. But after this class, and after she really got a hold of forgiveness and freedom, I've since seen her testify, and what passion. What a different, it kind of reminded me of, of David here. He is, he's a guy who the Bible says is a man who has a heart after God's own heart. Should be some tenderness, understanding there. Well, I mean, it should be, a, then there is, it comes through in life, but but instead, he just knows rage at this point. Why? I believe because this stuff is sitting inside of him. It's never been dealt with. It's just kind of, well, we'll get a work around that. Hallelujah. Got to make our forgiveness real. Can you say amen? First Peter, I think, it's, I, think I got the NLV, 18, 118. You know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It wasn't paid with mere silver or gold, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. You know, we have been purchased. We don't have a right to remain ugly inside. Beat ourselves up. You say, well, yeah, but, uh, you, don't, you, you don't know. I mean, in my house, you know, then we get, you know, tensions rise or this happens and I get, and then, uh, or this happened to me. And it's like the old, I deal with people where I'm at oftentimes with PTSD. and everything. It's like, uh, man, you did what? Well, I was feeling this again. You know, so I did something more foolish. I, I responded. I well, you know what? If this stuff just has access and right to crop up inside of us, this old feelings, these old haunts in places, uh, dark shadows of our past, you know what? That's kind of what people do. I was with the man. We were traveling um, recently. We were able to go by a particular place. We were traveling. We were in our town making a little journey across town. And as we went through a certain place, somebody in the car remarked about, what goes on there? He goes, yeah, a bunch of filthy, you know, this, that, and the other thing, scum in there. I thought, this is a Christian man. And I'm thinking, I wonder what's still bothering him. But he's faithful to church, and I know his family and his life, and a lot of wonderful things, but there's just this one element when he gets around something, like, ah, he despises that. I wonder if it has to do with where he was in his past. Actually, I don't wonder. I know the man. I know the story. I'm able to help him, but golly, man. It, it's not necessarily, see, a lot of these things aren't mysteries, folks. It's stuff that needs to be forgiven and gotten over. You know, forgive and forget. That's a fine little saying that irritates the fire out of some people. How do you do that? You Christ can do it. I can't forget my past. I remember stuff. Oh, my goodness. I, I don't think about it. I don't go back there. It's been years by the grace of God. Time doesn't heal. Jesus does. And you and I have to learn how to let go. And I wonder if this is where we find David here. Is he still holding on to so much stuff? He has not brought it to God. He's not let it go. 
and we find a man that is what? Filled with rage. Just consumed. I wonder if when God found Moses those 40 years down the road, Moses, he, you couldn't have a finer upbringing as far as education, um, you know, school, and all the etiquette of, of being a, a leader, a good man, a strong man. He's a wise man. He's everything. But he kills a man. 40 years old. Remember, he killed the Egyptian. I know some folks, well, so he was thinking about, well, well, no, he murdered a man. Why do you bury a body if you don't murder a man? He murdered him. He knew. I have really messed up. And he runs. And 40 years later, God finds him in the wilderness, and God begins to minister to him. I wonder if Moses has spent 40 years going, what in the world is wrong with me? What do I? He, 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 maybe he didn't bring that to the Lord. Maybe he's just got it in still. Because when God begins to call him and tell him what he's got in store for him, Moses can't seem to respond. Remember, he's, he's got a whole list of excuses. He's got them. And I wonder if it's just this stuff that's boiling in there. I, I messed up too much. I messed up. I messed up too much. I messed up. See, living this way incapaca incapacitates a person. It really does. It just incapacitates it. It's a sad, sad way to go. What we need to do is understand our God is better than that. So good. You know, my first scriptures I memorized when I was a youngster in the Lord is, taste of the Lord, amen. See that he's good. Taste. Blessed is the man. That's, that's Psalms 34. Eight. In, the, in the second part, part of that scripture is, blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. He brings his life to God. Doesn't carry all the excess stuff, that drops things off, lets God take it, doesn't go back there. What Jesus did for us is it makes this so doable. The Amplified Version says in Isaiah 53, 3, he was despised and rejected and forsaken by men. He's a man of sorrows, a man of pain, Acquainted with grief. You know, he felt what people like to hold on to. Why? Because they don't know how to get rid of it. They don't, it's not like they like that, you know. You can't wait to you know, pick the scab again, you know, make it bleed. No, it's just that they don't know how. He, he, he felt it all. And he did nothing wrong. He was despised was unappreciated. He's borne our grief, sickness, weakness, distresses, carried our sorrows, our pains, our punishment. Yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, spitten, afflicted of God and as somebody with leprosy. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. He took this for us. Don't hang on to it. We have to let go. And I thank God because uh, he, he helped me through some of this stuff very early on. I, uh, I don't think I would have lived long my, my former life. It, you know, it just, uh, I was a good sinner. Not a smart one, just a good one. And then when I get saved and the stuff is on me, you know, a lot of young men graduate high school, I was going to do that, but the, a lot of them graduate. They they got a, uh, they're they're thinking of college. They got a list. I had a list. Time I was sixteen, and it was what to do with some people. It was not good. I I came from a bad bad past, and so I get saved in my early twenties. Thank God I lived to that point. And when I got saved, that's why this stuff boiled up, I think, so quickly. And I'm thinking, gee whiz, how do you go back? And, well, I couldn't. But God brought me true redemption, and God enabled me to reach back and help people who were on the other side of my list. I mean, boy, God is incredible. 
it was the end of my long journey. I was only 22, but my journey wouldn't have been much longer. God took care of that. You can't live under that weight. It leads you to separation, aloneness, even in the church. Even though church is still alone. Yeah, I, I watched these ladies. Somebody, a strange daughter came to that graduation class, and I saw the young, she's an adult, I saw her break down, and I saw, better than any picture, I, I could see right to, she's thinking, this is what's been wrong with me and mom. She didn't know. Mom went through all that in her youth. And mom was doing the best she could, but she had inner turmoil, the guilt of her past, and she raised her daughters to, as best she could, but there was always all these problems. And I watched the young lady, who's not saved, get a, a revelation that day and looked at her, and I saw her take her mom in the foyer and just hold on to her. She didn't know. I've heard these gals testify since. I see the element of freedom in ministry. They're bringing people to church. They're helping folks. I want to tell you, maybe nobody knows the burden you've carried, the troubles you've seen, so to speak, but Jesus Christ can make a brand new product out of your heart. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, anyone's in Christ. Supposed to be a brand new creation with all the old things having passed. We have no business carrying the past. You won't forget it, but you don't have to carry it. You don't have to live in the shadow of it because the things that are impossible for men, they're absolutely doable with God. Absolutely. And I tell you, when I was reading those abortion, Planned Parenthood sites and different things, I was reading their answers, because these ladies, they get so many people coming, they're, they're, they want to burn the place, they want to burn the building down after they do the deed. And, and so they go back, help me. And they say, well, you know, it's common to feel this way. Uh, you're not hanging around people that put guilt on you, you know, like families and friends and going to church anywhere. I mean, they're bothered by that. They don't go to the... Let, find out, you know, you're probably under pressure from other people, and oh, it's all inside, it's all eternal, internal. And then what blew my mind, one of these most extensive sites I read, all their answers, they finally come to the last, last suggestion is YouTube. See what others do. Good luck. Thank God for Jesus. David said, you know what? That buck stops here. This is me. I have really... And you know what he did? Uh, verse 20 of that chapter says, he got up from the ground. He's on the ground after... Yeah, he just... He's, his, his people in his house, are, they don't even want to touch him. They don't want to speak to him. You know, he's squirming, turmoil. We know the baby's dying, all this stuff's going on. David is just... He, they're scared of him. He is out of his mind. They're afraid of him. He says, what are you guys being quiet for? And we're, we're not being quiet. Everything's good. Baby dead. Baby died. You know, Bathsheba lost the child. This is a child. You know what? David got up from the ground, verse 20. After he washed, he put on lotions, he cleaned himself up, changed his clothes. He went to the house of the Lord and worshiped. He said, you know, there is no other place to go. You know, and this is what the devil, he, isn't he a good liar, you know, when you're suffering and you keep digging up your past, you're living in something of the past. He, he, he could just, you know, with the billows, he's just flaming it on, you know, and, and yet you know, so many people, I've, I've followed up on people, I've ministered to people, I don't know how many times over the decades, said, hey, you, we, are you okay? We miss you. Where have you been? Well, I was feeling so bad, I, I, I could go to church. Well, that's where you should go. You know what I'm saying? How many times? Well, well brother, well, have you been reading your Bible? No, why should I? Well, <laughs> that's where the answers are. You praying? No. David said, you know what? Enough of what is me and what I have done. I repent. I give this to God. Turn from my sin. I go to the house of God. God was able to recover this man. 
I do not suggest you think, say, eh, you know, you can get by with sin. God help us from that mentality. I'm talking about a lot of people are saved a year, two, five, 10, 20, and still carrying hurts. Let them go. Take ownership. Do not try to convince some, your mind and other, you know, well, you know, if this hadn't happened, I would never have been. I didn't. Let's just give this to God this morning. What, can we do that? Let's bow our heads for a moment. We're going to pray. We're going to call out on heaven. And thank God, our God is so very good. It's not like he doesn't know where we've been, what has happened, what have people done, what our excuses were, what our lies were. God sees, God knows, but God redeems. And he does it when we can come honestly and repentantly before him. And today, maybe, maybe today, maybe a friend brought you, perhaps you're just seeking God, you think it's time to get in church, know, find out if there's where you can go with God. What, what can God do? But the issue is this, God wants to totally redeem you, save you, cleanse you, not work you through, you know, some ups and downs and, you know, and try to figure, help you figure out uh, why everything went wrong and what someone did. Or God wants to start in the, the place I talked about this, or quoted the scripture in 2 Corinthians 5. He just wants you to start to, to become a man or a woman in Christ, receiving him into your life, receiving his grace, his salvation, and he begins the process of making all things new. Our heads are bowed, and you say, Preacher, I need to know that forgiveness. I want God to save me. I want God to cover my sins. I want Jesus to redeem me right now. Would you lift a hand and hold it up where I can see it? Wherever you're seated this morning, just hold a hand up for a moment. Right in your chair. Lift it towards heaven. Say, God, this is me. I need you. Amen. Amen. Hold it up. I need you to save me. Cover my sin. God bless you. Hand over there, hand over there. God bless you. God bless you. Who else? Maybe it's because you've carried stuff. You've, you've come to Christ before and you find yourself struggling. You're up, you're down, you're backwards, you're, you're, you're sliding away. You're, you're, in, you're in turmoil. You know you've separated yourself from God by bad decisions. and things. Would you lift a hand and say, I want to come to Jesus Christ and find his forgiveness today. Others, would you join with these? And with a lifted hand, you'd simply say, God, here's my hand, help me. Merciful to me. Forgive me. There's no going back and making amends and paying for the past, but there is cleansing. With a lifted hand, you say, God, wash away my past. Forgive me. Anyone else, quickly, because we're going to change the order of the service. But those who raised hands this morning, what you need to do There'll be a lot of people praying at this altar, and what you need to do is come also and make your peace with God. Surrender your heart at this altar. Pray this morning and let Jesus help you. Maybe God has spoken to you, my brother and sister. There's something that says, time to let this be totally my past. I'm gonna let God help you reckon with something, deal with something. I'm gonna leave it at an altar this morning. Let's stand to our feet, if you would, with me, everyone. The, Singers are going to sing a song and worship, but you can come. The altar is open. We invite you this morning. Come and lay hold of God. Let him help you. Let him minister. Bring grace to your life. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Jesus is calling Oh Have you come to the end of yourself Should it be a thirst for a drink from well Jesus is calling Oh Oh come to the altar the 
Amen. If, if you're still praying, you can pray as long as you like. But uh, if you're not, you can stand with us and just where you are. And I, I want to pray for some this morning. Um, I mentioned a very touchy subject, abortion. Uh, it's, it's, no matter how much of a grace you can try to minister a subject like this, I find there's often people, men and women, who've been involved and they just can't even, mm, it just takes a stab at them, and I'm not going to call you forward or something this morning. But there's more issues of the past than abortion that just cause this deep wounding in this place in people's hearts that they it just, it's just, it's that nerve gets hit. And maybe this morning you'd say, I need to bring closure in my life. I want you to bow your head for a moment to, before the Lord, if we could all do that. Say, there is an issue, there is an area, there's an arena of the past, and I have got to let this go. I take ownership of my deed and my part, but I let it go and make a confession this morning. If that's you, I want you to lift a hand, and I want to pray for you. God bless you, bless you, bless you. These are a lot of folks, and there's always something, you know, in, in, in an assembly any size, there's people just carrying stuff. Tired of carrying it, I want you to lift your hands towards heaven. I want you to say, Lord God, say this with me, Lord God, I want freedom. I cast down the guilt of my past. The blood of your son, Jesus Christ, has cleansed and forgiven me. I take ownership of my guilt and I repent. And I will close this door and walk in your light and walk in your freedom and bring the testimony of your joy and redemption forth from my life. Thank you. Set me free right now in Jesus' name. Let's give him praise for that. He'll do that this morning within our hearts. God, thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Come to the altar, Father. Oh, why? Oh, God, we Oh, we 
wonderful. He's wonderful. Hallelujah. We're going to leave in the power of that word with the drip of the blood of Jesus. His grace, his forgiveness, and his mercy. Tonight, Sister Claus, prayer meeting, part two. Pastor Dave Stansky. Our heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. You be a blessing to someone. Have a great day of fellowship. Take a nap. <laughs> Love someone. I'm going to ask Brother Caleb to lift his voice and ask God's blessing as we are dismissed today. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your grace, Lord, and your mercy, God, your redemption, God, in our lives. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to take this as we go home this morning, Lord, and that you would help us to come home, to go home safe, God, and to come back. We just give you all the praise and the glory. We just thank you. And oh, come to the altar. Thanks for joining us this morning. If you gave your life to Jesus today, congratulations. We'd love to connect with you. To help us do that, click the link below that says New Believers Start Here. If you have any questions or prayer requests, follow the other links to share those with us as well. We hope you have a beautiful Sunday and we'll see you back here for our 7 p.m. service.